Okay, everybody, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, this afternoon or evening or morning, I don't know, depending on where you're calling from, uh, we're excited to host historians Charlie uh, Allison and Zoe Baker to discuss the revolutionary strategy and practice of anarchists in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, they're going to be drawing on their respective works, both of which were published in the last six months. Um, and that includes, uh, let's see, Charlie's uh, No Harmless Power, um, The Life and Times of the Ukrainian Anarchist Nestor Maknow, and Zoe Baker's uh, Means and Ends, uh, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States. So in case this is your first Fires from event, um, and you haven't heard this spiel a hundred times already. Uh, we are a 16-year-old radical bookstore um, owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities um, in the South. Uh, we're still doing um, a fair number of events online like this one, both because we know that there continue to be a lot of barriers of access uh, for folks in our community, whether that's COVID or other things, um, and also because it gives us a chance to connect with authors and audiences who maybe wouldn't make it in store. And I think today, uh, yet again, is another great example of that. I'm really appreciative of uh Zoe joining in from um, across an ocean. Uh, so later this month, um, we uh, have another event that I want to go ahead and mention um, that will be virtual. That's uh, with contributors to Deviant Hollers, who are going to talk with us about queerness and settler colonialism in Appalachia. So if you're interested in that event or others a little further out, um, definitely check out our online calendar. You could follow us on social media. And I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. All of those are good ways to keep up with uh, what's going on both in store and also here on the internet. So today we are uh, using Zoom's uh, kind of webinar uh, platform with the Q&A tool. So uh, if you are on a phone, that might be up at the top. On I think on desktops, the Q&A tool is typically at the bottom. Regardless, like dig around and find it because we would love it if you would share questions as we go. We're going to have some time set aside at the end specifically for audience questions, uh, but it's nice to go ahead and start getting those queued up. So just if something sparks uh, sparks an interest or a follow-up, please go ahead and jot it out, um, and we'll be appreciative uh, of having it later. So just to introduce uh, our two authors today, uh, Charlie Allison is a writer, researcher, and storyteller based in Philadelphia. He's published short stories with Pickman's Press, Podcastle, and Sea Lion Press. He currently runs his own website at charlie-allison.com, where the genesis for No Harmless Power formed as a series of YouTube videos with the help of Sewer Rats Productions. He's active in the Philadelphia storytelling and mutual aid communities. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Zoe Baker is a libertarian socialist philosopher with a PhD on the history of anarchism, which is not something that very many people can say. Uh, she's known for popularizing the theory and history of anarchism, feminism, and Marxism on her popular uh, YouTube and Twitter platforms. So welcome to both of you. Really appreciate your time. Um, there's a siren in the background. Hopefully it's not loud for y'all. Uh, I am going to go ahead and pass off to Charlie, who's going to kick us off and share a little bit about No Harmless Power. Assuming we've got a good enough connection. Charlie, can you hear me all right? And you're on mute, so we're not getting your audio yet. But Right. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? And, and by everyone, I mean, can Liberty hear me all right? And Zoe, because I can't see the rest of you. Um, Charlie Allison, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I wrote No Harmless Power because, well, uh, I, I didn't think that there was a uh, 
general access uh, book on Nestor Machno, uh, wait, who you're talking about. Uh, so I wanted to see what I could do um, to take what sources were available in English because I'm monolingual. I'm not super uh, fluent or even conversant in other languages and uh, started writing about his life uh, for a period of a couple of years. Uh, and in a supreme act of hubris, I started it off with a series of YouTube videos that eventually became a book uh, about this Ukrainian revolutionary anarchist who I keep being surprised whenever I, I look up his Wikipedia page or look at my book, I'm like, and he lived through the Civil War? Like, he, he takes so many exorbitant risks. And I'm always shocked that he gets Paris. Charlie, I'm, there. I'm losing your audio um, a little bit. I just want to make sure it's just not just me. Yeah, Zoe, are you, are you losing a, some a of Charlie's audio? Individual. Yeah, I, I'm also losing audio. It kind of comes in and out. Um, like I get the ends of sentences, but not the start. Um, so yeah, yeah I'm wondering. Fun. Yeah, Charlie, do you have? Is there any possibility of moving closer to the source of your internet or anything like that? We could also, if you wanted to try to another device. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Be right back. Okay, great. Should we, yeah. should, should, in the interest of keeping it rolling, Zoe, would you be comfortable actually yeah. sharing first? Sure, I can do that. Uh, these things happen. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, Welcome. So, I wrote a book called Means and Ends, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States. It covers the years 1868, which is the kind of, it, it's a key part of the emergence of anarchism as a social movement in, in the first international. And it ends in uh, 1939, which is the end of the Spanish Revolution slash Civil War, although I don't cover that because it's such a huge topic. Um, it was kind of like an arbitrary cutoff point for I'm not going to look at sources after this date because uh, some really important sources happened to come out in like 1938, like Rudolf Rocker's anarcho-syndicalism uh, theory and practice. Um, so what's my book about? Well, it's a kind of uh, intellectual history of what anarchists thought about a revolutionary strategy. So it's, it's an overview of the ideas, emphasizing uh, the ideas it's about the ideas that underpinned their actions as opposed to a kind of narrative history that's about their lives and who was dating who and why this organization fell apart. Uh, and it's not a kind of attempt to write a like total history of anarchism because you need to know an obscene amount of languages to do that and it would take several volumes. Um, it has like a limited scope, which is just, just their strategy. And I'm like, my background's in philosophy. So it's really kind of emphasizing um, the arguments that they gave for, you know, why should we engage in direct action? Why should we not um, engage in electoral politics? How should we structure organizations? Uh, and then I try to illustrate the ideas with, you know, examples. So it's not just about, you know, Malatesta said this, Kropotkin said that. I also ground it in actual struggle by workers. Um, and so it's trying to do kind of best of both worlds rather than like being a pure history of philosophy book or a pure kind of chronological history book. Um, and so the kind of central goal is to reconstruct historical anarchist theory as an interconnected system. So I'm establishing not only what they thought, but also the logical connection between different aspects of anarchist theory. So in particular, how the way in which they think about society uh, which is uh, their, like their social theory, how they think about human action, their views on human nature, what they think social structures are, how social structures are reproduced over time, you know, things like that, how that underpins everything they say about revolutionary strategy. Um, and that's the kind of really big thing that the book's about. So, you know, in the blurb, I say that um, I demonstrate that anarchist strategy was grounded in a theoretical framework called the theory of practice which maintain that as people engage in activity, they simultaneously change the world and themselves. Um, so 
for example, you know, a bunch of workers go on a strike and during the course of the strike, they develop new abilities they didn't have before, like how to uh, persuade uh, colleagues to join the union, how to make decisions in a general assembly, how to stand up to their uh, boss in like an effective manner. At the same time, they're going to develop new ideas. So they might, you know, initially not know what a union is or not understand the point of it. And then during the course of the struggle, their views have changed. And they also develop new uh, psychological drives, such as they now want to um, organize the working class to say, you know, overthrow uh, their oppressors. Um, and so the key thing is that people can change through struggle. And so if you want to change the world, uh, they, they try and emphasize which forms of action develop people in a way that moves towards anarchism uh, rather than away from it. So they think that the means that revolutionaries propose to achieve social change have to involve forms of activity which transform people into individuals who are capable of and driven to both overthrow capitalism the state and build a free society. And so the core of anarchism is this idea, which is that anarchist ends can only be achieved through anarchist means hence the name of the book, Means and Ends. And in anarchism, this idea is called the unity of means and ends. Um, and that's the kind of core thing holding everything really in the book together is how again and again, they're grounding everything in this idea that you can only achieve anarchist ends through anarchist means. So for example, you know, if you want to overthrow the state, well then you shouldn't be standing in elections to win state power um, because it, instead you're going to be changed by that activity and become a kind of, uh, tool of the state itself, someone who reproduces the state, you start out as a revolutionary and then through the process of electoral politics, you end up being like, well, actually, we need to work within the system to change it. Uh, and, and you kind of like abandon your revolutionary ideas due to the kind of activity you're engaging in. And so if you want to actually overthrow the state, then you need to remain, to use historical anarchist terminology, outside of and against it. Um, and that's just like one example I can go on and on. Um, and one of the people that I do talk about in the book, uh, it is Nesta Magno, which is the same person that uh, Charlie's book is about. Uh, and Nesta Magno, the thing I focus on uh, is his ideas on what's called organizational dualism, which is the idea that uh, radicals should organize both uh, mass organizations, open to all workers, so like a trade union, a tenant union, co-ops, etc., cetera, and um, organizations composed exclusively of uh, anarchist uh, militants and the idea is, is that the specific anarchist organization participates in the mass organizations and movements in order to spread anarchist ideas and push the struggle forward and what Macno and, and his uh, friends uh, although they do have some fallings out but the, this group called the group of Russian anarchists abroad they uh, propose a model of organizational dualism called platformism uh, which it's very complicated, but the short version is, it says that in order for a specific anarchist organization to be effective at, at performing its role of spreading anarchist ideas, building revolutionary power of workers, overthrowing capitalism in the state, uh, it needs to have what they call theoretical and tactical unity. So it has a narrow program that unites them. That means that they're all moving in the same direction. So rather than say, you know, some anarchists in the organization are pro-participating in unions, others are against it, and somehow they try and work together. It's like, no, we all have to agree on the kind of nuts and bolts in order to ensure that our actions don't contradict one another. We're going to be all working together in the same direction. And the other thing, they, the other key aspect of what they think is that uh, decisions uh, made at Congresses uh, should be binding on everyone in the, in, in, the, in the specific anarchist organization, rather than only those who vote in favor of them. And that's in order to maintain the theoretical and tactical uh, unity. So I think they call this collective responsibility. So as a member of the organization, you have an obligation to uh, act in a manner that's consistent with its program, it's consistent with the agreements that have been made in the organization. And if you don't do that, then you shouldn't be a member, right? Um, and that's the nuts and bolts, very short version. Other anarchists at the time are like, no, this is super authoritarian, accuse them of being anarcho-Bolsheviks uh, and basically becoming like Lenin and Trotsky and so forth. And this is largely based on them being quite unclear in the original platform about certain key points, which led to misinterpretations. They used some vague language and they then publish a series of clarifications in which they're like, yeah, no, we don't want to like rule over the masses. We don't want to um, basically be like an anarchist version of the Bolshevik party. Um, but those um, articles in which they clarify their views 
have kind of were kind of forgotten and ignored and um people kind of forget that the, the, the original name for the platform includes the words draft in the subtitles and that's really important it was like a draft uh, and then the, and, and a key part of understanding them is the later things they write in which they, they clarify a bunch of stuff although there was to end on one final point before i've used up my time um one valid critique of it was made by malatesta the italian anarchist which is that he basically goes well if you're doing majority voting with binding congress resolutions well then um where what the majority vote you know votes for at the meeting is then binding on everyone in the organization the problem is that let's say there are four positions at the congress uh and you can then end up in a situation where one position that's backed by a numerical minority of the organization wins the most votes because of the way in which the voters split into like four main positions and that will then lead to a situation where you won't even have majority rule you actually you have the minority position being imposed on everyone in the organization um and there is an obvious response to this which is that well if it's split that many times we need a super majority you know like 80 percent of the congress has to agree with it for it to be binding on everyone i'm not aware there aren't good sources on how the platformist organizations historically because there weren't that many actually did the binding congress resolutions and if they you know required a super majority or malatesta's objection applied but like it wasn't all straw man is my point like there were some legitimate points uh, and not just them you know being misunderstood in part because of their own lack of clarity uh, so yeah that that's that's me <laughs> awesome um, charlie it looks like so, you're yeah oh I was going to say, does Did Charlie you... want to go now that his internet seems better? Awesome, yeah. And it does look like we've got a better connection. Yeah, uh, I can go. Uh, thanks, Zoe. That, that was a marvelous introduction to your very, very much fun to read book. Um, uh, I'm Charlie. I wrote um, No Harmless Power. Uh, Zoe already covered... Um, do it in stereo now um except for again my blur defeated it but um uh zoe already covered uh very very briefly uh machno's contribution and working out of the platform in paris in the late 20s to early 30s um i started writing my book um after doing a series of YouTube videos on Machno uh, and getting absurdly lucky. Um, and as I wrote the book, I, I sort of approached it from uh, a very sort of synthesis, uh, not synthesis anarchist in this case, but synthesis uh, in the sense of reading everything I could possibly find on Machno, including uh, fiction. Uh, I did not expect to find uh, Nestor Machno popping his head up in Michael Moorcock's uh, Piat Quartet, which is like um, basically what happens if you just uh, make a really super unreliable fascist narrator, Forrest Gump his way through uh, the Russian Empire, Europe, America. And he's just a horrible person, Piat, uh, but because he grew up this fictional fascist, um, Machno shows up more than once. Um, and through Moorcock, who is an anarchist, uh, and actually had some uh, correspondence with Leah Feldman, who, who had been a medic in the Machnavist uh, battalions and was alive up until 1990. Uh, it's sort of like the inclusion of Feldman and Machno in uh, Moorcock's work is sort of a wink to the audience like, hey, by the way, Piat's full of shit and lies to you all the time. Maybe you shouldn't listen to the fascist, but you're kind of stuck with him. And he suffers a lot, so it's fun. Um, anyway, so the, the synthesis part of this also went to nonfiction. Um, I was shocked when I started writing the book about how everyone in the anarchist scenes across continents seems to know each other or know of each other. Um, I was most surprised by Asugi Sakai, a, a very famous, in Japan anyway, uh, Japanese anarchist who just decided to go and visit Paris and try to get to a Machnavist convention 
not convention, anarchist gathering in Berlin in 1922 uh, and has various scrapes and misadventures all, all through this uh, and then writes a very damning critique of the Russian Revolution uh, and, and saying, yeah, the Machnavists had a lot of stuff right, but um, the Bolsheviks, you know, uh, stabbed them in the back whenever they could, and there was no broad agreement about what would an anarchist polity look like. Uh, and he he is actually one of the sources that points out that the Nabat Confederation, which is uh, often heard in reference to Volin, um, one of our really good sources for the Makhnovist movement, uh, clashed a little bit with uh, the Makhnovshina um, uh, while they were both around, uh, saying they're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and so from that sort of those tensions, um, I found another quote of Moorcox that's in the beginning of the book, which is like, the idea of heroism is a betrayal and a fantasy of, of all the good we could be doing. And Makhno through his life sort of falls into the sort of charismatic Robin Hood hero archetype. And we want him to win, but do we actually want him as a person to win or do we want like a uh, truly egalitarian uh, anarchist world to win. And the, the difference is uh, a pretty big one. Um, so th that's where I started poking around and then expanded into hopefully uh, a readable and maybe even funny book that's a good introduction for even non-anarchists uh, to get to know about Machno. On the cover, the back cover advertises uh, about uh, of some gun safety tips that show up in your book. Um, mm. uh, what what are the what are the gun safety uh, takeaways from from uh, Nestor Machno's life? <laughs> uh, according to some sources, I found Nestor Machno in meetings that were going really long would take his revolver and do the cowboy thing because that's not just an uh, American. West film trope just starts spinning it and like the safeties of a hundred year plus years ago probably aren't the same so like I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't do that Machno maybe don't um, and yeah it's very ADD kid with a, a fidget spinner energy right there um, so don't do that even if the meeting is very dull just don't pull out a revolver and start twirling it. That is the only gun safety tip I can reasonably give. Extremely red flag. Um, yeah, so y'all have have both written historical works that cover some of the same some of the same uh, kind of kind of incidents, times, movements, like figures. Um, and I know that y'all have both engaged a bit with each other's work um, in the run up to this event. Uh, so just hoping to kind of turn the space over to y'all uh, to kind of talk about anything that um, either stood out in the other's work or questions you might have for each other or, I don't know, things that you'd like to explore together. So who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, I uh, let me think. So in your book, Charlie, uh, one of the things I kind of liked was that you're trying, you know, there's a tendency when talking about certain famous anarchists, like mythologize them and talk about them as that they're not really like a person with flaws, but also, you know, strengths. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, what 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 do you kind of regard as Macno's kind of like virtues and vices as like a complex three-dimensional person rather than as just kind of like a famous name that, you know, gets turned into an icon, like he appears on coins and, you know, things like that. Yeah, no, uh, great question. Um, I mentioned in the book a bit, but like there, there's one trait of Machno's that I immediately think of uh, that serves as both, and I'll, I'll flesh it out a little bit, but like, especially in the early days, he's like a big time micromanager. I have to do everything myself. And how that's a, a strength and also a weakness. It's a strength accidentally. I want to be clear, micromanaging is not cool. Do not do it if you have any other option. Um, uh, so more than a few times because he believes that he personally has to go attend to like very minor matters, um, it saves his life. Um, like when the first time 
his hometown, Julia Polier, is taken by the Austro-Hungarians. He's not snapped up and, you know, immediately shot because he was out of town uh, trying to deal with uh, dotting an I or crossing a T. Um, it also drives people crazy. So, like, that's the cost benefit. Might just save your life. Drives people out to see you every day. Nuts. Um, uh, I think that Machno is, or was, I guess, um, very much um, someone who uh, strength-wise wanted to do something uh, as swiftly as possible and as well as possible. And he generally wasn't willing to sacrifice one for the other, um, which if you're, if you're running military campaigns is probably a pretty good trait. Um, he was also, I, I would say, um, you know, empathetic as much as one can be empathetic and still lead armies. Like the two kind of clash. Uh, he has more than one nervous breakdown in the course of the Russian Civil War. Um, like with suicidal ideation, I don't see how you don't. But then he writes about it and he's very frank about it in his autobiographies, which only go up to a certain point, uh, are, I think, a, a very interesting sign of someone who's okay with being somewhat vulnerable. He also does not, um, and here's the here are the downsides of Machno. Uh, he could be very brusque. He could interrupt people, and if he was convinced that something was the right course of action, uh, he would just go and try and do it, uh, which is not super great for anarchist consensus and uh, any sort of democratic process. Uh, he gets in trouble for this. Uh, at one point, he's in a, a disciplinary hearing for. Um, the, what is called the Polanski affair, where an old friend of his, Polanski, joins the Bolsheviks, tries to poison him uh, and his upper command staff. He's arrested. Uh, the poison's found. And instead of, you know, being tr being dealt with in the way that, uh, you know, everyone agreed upon, uh, Polanski and the conspirators are taken out and shot by the Kontrasvedka out by a uh, a river and Machno is okay with this sort of rubber stamped it. And he's in this disciplinary hearing. He goes for his gun when his other anarchist comrades are saying, Hey, you can't really do that sort of thing. And it's only with great effort that like he's made to back down and like he gets a slap on the wrist. So like that sort of a tendency of micromanaging when you turn the volume up so much is um, a dangerous thing. Um, and it could be very, I guess if we're talking uh, a person that has dimensions. He'd be very petty. Uh, he never really forgave Voline for being Voline. Uh, and that caused a lot of problems, especially because Voline was a big synthesis anarchist. Uh, but it also been uh, in the Maknoshina. And I could go on about this for like eight or 10 hours. Um, I'll, I'll stop now, but I'd like to ask you a question, Zoe, which is um, how did you, um, and this is, I guess, more of a, uh, inside baseball or a writing craft question. You, you use excellent, uh, very precise uh, quotations for what you're talking about, no matter who you're working with um, and what the time period is. Um, did for, for the process of writing a book this big, did you, well, what was your process of um, uh, finding and isolating and integrating quotations from a across time and space? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so what I did was I wrote up a list of every single anarchist primary source I was going to read. And then I read them all. And as I read them all, I copy out quotes as I find them and catalog those quotes by subject matter. So I have then an entire library of quotes by all these famous anarchists on, on topics and let's say, and the reason for this is that I don't know what I'm gonna need to know about going forward uh, because often unexpected topics come up. You know, I have some idea and I was always paranoid, like, you know, what it, I, I, I can't literally copy out every single quote because then I'm just actually rewriting their books and that's no longer <laughs> useful. It has to be a selection, it can't be every single word. 
So, you know, I would be like, okay, you know, violence, decision-making, organization, state socialism, et cetera, or like, you know, definitions of freedom. Um, and then when I'm writing, let's say, you know, I'm writing about freedom, I just go to my quote library, look at all my quotes on freedom, and then that's like the basis. Um, and then as I'm going along, you know, I, I during the course of the PhD, I became like less hardcore adding, adding everything to the quote library just because I was so overwhelmed. Uh, and so, because this original function was gonna be like, I basically don't have to do so much work again in the future because it's all there in my library. And then it, the plan was it would be like a website so everyone else could also like easily find quotes on every single topic they want to like, learn about, you know, with full page references so they can read the entire thing it's from and get the context because, you know, quotes can be misunderstood just in isolation. Um, and the other thing I would do is, you know, I will word search every single time Bakunin uses a specific word. And I will then write down the page numbers for every single time. And then I will go through, copy it all out. I now know every single time he uses the word, what it means, how his meaning changes if it doesn't, you know. Uh, and, and I'll do that for like a lot of things. And I became kind of slightly obsessed with terminology uh, through that. Um, so, you know, things like when did they first use the word direct action? Because like it doesn't appear in the earliest sources. And I know because I spent ages word searching <laughs> direct action on top of like, you know, reading everything. Uh, and, you know, the earliest I was able to find was in the first issue of uh, Freedom, which is like a, a English anarchist newspaper. Um, and that's in like, off the top of my head, early 1880s. Um, and you know, they use equivalent phrases to of direct action, but that's like specific, uh, you know, and word is like a later appearance first when the actors movement first appears. And you know, that that's basically how I did it, like a combination of just like diligence, like copying out quotes and obsessiveness. So, you know, like mon maniacally word searching like too many PDFs um, to, to try and you know find the patterns, because I was really worried about. I don't want a situation where I claim I'm writing a book about anarchism and really it's actually a book about Bakunin. Um, I wanted it to be representative of the movement and to do that, I needed a wide source base and I had to keep track of multiple authors at once rather than, you know, I didn't want to present one. I wanted to always be careful of not presenting one person's views as the movement and also at the same time, you know, pointing out the exceptions to generalizations. Um, one that isn't in the book, but, you know, just off the top of my head, for example, is, you know, someone will be like, oh, anarchists, historical anarchists never use the word democracy as a, you know, for their ideal society. They just say free association or anarchy. Democracy without the state is like a modern invention that appears in the 20th century, you know, from the kind of new left onwards. And it's like, well, that's not true because there's one Russian anarchist most people haven't heard of called Gregory Maximov who does say anarchism is a kind of democracy about the state. Uh, he, do, he doesn't mean in that anything different than what other anarchists are saying. Um, it's just a different label. Some would argue not a good label, but that's a separate question. Um, and so, you know, little, little exceptions like that, I also became really interested in to kind of represent its diversity in a kind of non-dogmatic manner, um, rather than acting as if, you know, it's kind of like this like religious scripture model of like this famous person said it so it's what they all thought and it's like well it's always more complicated and I was always trying to find you know obscure people or organize I, I tried to like reference you know I'll quote like a, a newspaper that doesn't you know often appear alongside like the famous author so I was trying to combine like a movement perspective anonymous activists you know rank and file with the kind of big names that, you know, were super famous. Um, and that was for me important as like, you know, I'm not just writing anarchist history, I'm an anarchist historian. And so I need to apply that to how I'm approaching history and not write kind of, you know, this is what anarchist thought is actually just, you know, three um, guys with big beards <laughs> as, as the entire movement, which kind of some early like secondary literature on anarchism kind of was, it was like, and each big man would get his own chapter and there would be like seven of them usually. Um, and that's how, that's what you do to understand anarchism. And I was trying to have like a movement first perspective. Um, 
But yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I, I think that um, th there's sort of, and, and you alluded to it, there's sort of a warping effect of um, great men or women saying a thing. It, it starts to lose meaning or everyone thinks they know what they mean, um, uh, what they're talking about. Um, I, I was uh, particularly impressed with um, uh your description, analysis, and explanation of uh, Bakunin, because I'm sorry, we're going to talk about him at least a little bit more. Um, Bakunin's idea of the invisible uh, dictatorship and your uh, breaking it down through context and uh, explaining it to someone who has not read as much Bakunin as perhaps one should um, was, was extremely helpful. Um, could you go into the sort of uh, were, were there any particular challenges in writing that section of explaining uh, what Bakunin meant by invisible dictatorship or secret society? Yeah, I'm sure. So for those who aren't familiar, um, there's this kind of claim that gets repeated a lot in the secondary literature, both, you know, anarchist and Marxist is like Bakunin's this like secret authoritarian because in public he's like, yay, anarchism, but then in private he advocates the invisible dictatorship and oh you know he's this like super authoritarian and uh, it's not true it's a misrepresentation of the sources um so the invisible so so he's Bakunin's also an advocate of organizational dualism arguably he's the first advocate of organizational dualism so he has this he's in this mass organization the international working men's association the first international and he's also in this a secret organization that he co-founds in 1868 called the uh, Alliance. Uh, the, the, it, it, the history of Alliance is extremely complicated and messy, but the simple version is uh, it disbands. Um, uh, the, 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 there's two organizations that are founded with the same name. There's the Alliance, which is a public organization that joins the international. Uh, it gets its application gets rejected, and then it, it just becomes a normal section of the of the international. Um, and kind of ceases to exist beyond that. And at the same time, a secret organization called the Alliance has also formed, um, which um, doesn't dissolve itself immediately, uh, but within a few months falls apart due to infighting. Um, it then continues to exist as basically this kind of like informal social network of Bakun and his friends in various countries. Independently of this, a separate organization called the Alliance is founded in Spain which plays a key role in, in organizing the international in Spain and spreading anarchist ideas. And then once uh, the first international in Spain is set up, uh, they uh, decide to dissolve their Spanish alliance because it's, it's no longer needed. Like it was, uh, it was necessary at the start, but now we've got our sections going that they decided it was kind of not necessary anymore along with the fact that there was a lot of drama in the international happening at the time about like, you know, is Bakunin trying to take over this organization of this like nefarious secret organization? Um, and Bakunin writes letters being like, don't dissolve it. It serves this necessary strategic function. And they're like, okay, bro. And they like ignore him, um, <laughs> uh, which like happens a lot. Like people, Marx claims that Bakunin's like this dictator of this shadow organization called the Alliance. You actually read his correspondence and it's full of him like being like, please, can you do this? And they're like, no, we're not gonna. <laughs> um, so like he wasn't a, a dictator um, and the Alliance in practice was really more like an informal social network. But what he thought its job should be, would be to unite committed revolutionaries in order to you know spread anarchist ideas, push the revolutionary struggle forward within First International um, so that the first international could become this like instrument of, of, of class struggle, moving towards anarchism rather than away from it. Now, as part of this project, he writes a bunch of letters to people he knows, trying to persuade him of his views. On two, uh, in two of those letters, he refers to the influence of this specific anarchist organization as an uh, invisible dictatorship. Uh, and, and this gets taken out of context. I mean, like he means like an actual dictatorship like this. The secret organization is is uh, controlling society from the shadows, like a kind of puppet master. Um, and it, when you actually go through the context and read the entire letters, what it actually means is just that we uh, are effective organizers. 
So, you know, say they're helping to organize strikes, things like that. They're spreading ideas. So say they have a newspaper, they could do talks. Uh, and three, uh, they engage in actions that provide an example to others. That's all the dictatorship means. It just means influencing people. Um, and isn't and explicitly says over and over again that you know they shouldn't be commanding people, they shouldn't be seizing power. He explicitly rejects the idea of like a natural revolutionary dictatorship in the same letters. So like you know the the revolutionary group seizes power, then imposes socialism from above. He, he explicitly rejects that on the grounds that it will just lead to counter revolution. It won't lead to a you can't impose a free society. Uh, it has to be self managed and created from below in order to actually like achieve that goal. Um, and the reason why he uses this phrase in invisible dictatorship to refer to his normal ideas, because usually he never uses it, is because he's talking to uh, a, a person he knows who was in the alliance called Albert Richard, who is an actual supporter of di revolutionary dictatorships. And so he's trying to be like, you know, use his language to be like, yeah, here's why your dictatorship is bad and my dictatorship is good, which isn't actually a dictatorship. But he's trying to like, it's a kind of rhetorical move. And the other letter is, is a letter to another authoritarian called, um, I can never say his name, Nechev. He, he's kind of like revolution at all costs, blow everything up, assassinate everyone, have multiple organizations within organizations within organizations that he's like the mastermind behind. Um, and, and he's briefly like friends with Bakunin, uh, but they have like a massive falling out because essentially he's kind of not a nice person and does loads of bad things. Um, which also results in Bakuna not finishing his translation of Capital Volume One by Marx, <laughs> which is the key why, why, why one of the key reasons why Bakuna is expelled from the international is that he failed to meet his uh, obligation to translate uh, Marx's Capital, and therefore is like untrustworthy. Um, it was kind of used as like ammunition against him. Um, but yeah, so that's the attempt to summarize what's a really complicated topic, uh, and. I kind of feel like had an axe to grind because you know it gets repeated so much of like you know Bakunin actually advocates a dictatorship, uh, and so I kind of went a bit overboard, being like I'm going to quote you know everything on this um, just to systematically show his private and public statements are consistent with one another. He makes the exact same points in other letters, but doesn't call it the invisible dictatorship. Well, you know, in those letters saying I'm against dictatorship. So, you know, yeah, Bakunin wasn't a hidden authoritarian in terms of his revolutionary theory. Um, and it, yeah, it's like, it's not true, but it's kind of like one of these widespread myths that just gets repeated. So there's a few moments in the book where someone will be like, why are you talking about this so much? And the reason is, is because I'm subtweeting a book I read <laughs> that, that is wrong and I want to like show it's wrong without being like, you know, here's my response video. I'll just be like indirectly going like, you got this wrong. Um, but anyway, um, I actually come up with a question for you. Uh, so you've mentioned this before, but you know, you, you why the book begins with Osugi Sakai going uh, to try and meet Makno. Now, usually with books about you know a biography, you begin with they were born and this is what their mother was like and um and it kind of it chronologically happens or they might begin with you know like there's a marx biography that begins with him on a book with his manuscript for capital volume one um traveling by boat to the publisher to personally hand it in because he's worried about it being lost in the post uh, and then it goes you know back in time well you kind of i think made an interesting choice of like no i'm going to begin with a different person trying to find the, the person I'm writing about. And so I was wondering like why, you know, in the writing process, like why did you make that decision? Were you originally gonna do like a standard biography opening and then went, you know, I'm gonna do something weird. Um, so I was wondering your thoughts of like the decision to yeah, start with, with the Sugi. Um, uh, thanks for the wonderful answer and uh, an excellent question. Uh, so I, I uh... I started with Sugi Sakai because in the process of writing this book, um, I I kind of realized that um, there are far too many interesting people that I would not have time to talk about even nearly as much as I would want to. Um, and um, I wanted to sort of take a 
style of approach that would show what someone who is extremely interested and involved with uh, anarchism in the early 20th century will be able to like do or discover or write about Machno, right? Who's a contemporary? Uh, I mean, uh, Sakai dies in 23 during the great Kanto earthquake and is uh, murdered by the cops, but um, right. That sort of, I guess, um, outsider, but motivated outsider perspective. Uh, I think, I, I hope, uh, sort of pokes the reader in the brain a little bit like, hey, Machno was was not a minor thing while he was alive, uh, right? He was pretty well known. Uh, and that he's a less well-known figure now is not indicative of unimportance. And so like having someone who is, you know, uh, you know, uh, I had one of my friends uh, refer to Asugi Sakai as kind of like, uh, a red flag made up of other red flags in terms of just like the amount of trouble he gets himself into constantly. But having someone like Sakai who is moving around and interesting and um, just, you're wondering why have I never heard of Asugi Sakai if you're not like really into Japanese anarchism or even know what anarchism is. You're like, this person did what? And I've never heard about him. And I'm sort of hoping uh, as I wrote it to sort of prime the prompt for, okay, well, you've had that reaction with Asugi Sakai. Now here's a whole book about the guy he found deeply interesting. Uh, and I also wanted to sort of, uh, and this, this note got played up more as I wrote and rewrote. I, I wanted to step away from great man theory as much as was possible, possibly with a bat. Um, because I, I don't think that it's helpful. And I think that it, you know, sort of creates an authoritarian view of history, uh, and that only certain elevated people can do cool things as opposed to, we can all do cool things. We should just maybe coordinate it a little. Um, and that that's actually the genesis of the, um, famous anarchist or anarchist you should know about section in the back of the book, which is little one page biographies. And if I'm going to put in Osugi Sakai, there's no way I can leave out his partner because uh, they'd both hate that, that Ito Noe is not in this book. Uh, but she is in the afterward, so I, I feel okay uh, about that. Uh, thanks for the excellent question, though. Um, one tangent is that a, a weirdly kind of recurring thing in your book is stories of guys dressing up as women for the purpose of undercover operations in, in the like Russian anarchist movement. Because I, I read the accounts of like in Skurda's book or, or Macno of like, you know, there are stories of he would allegedly dress up as like a woman in order to go spying um, like enemy positions and stuff. And it's led to loads of memes of, you know, like femboy Nesta Macno. Um, but I was always never sure, you know, like to believe these stories or not, because with like a Robin Hood figure, people say all kinds of things about them. And obviously I want to believe that he engaged in cross-dressing for like very important tactical reasons. Um, but, you know, it's I've always just like, the fact that I want to believe it so much makes me want to doubt it at the same time, because you know, sometimes things are too good to be true. So I was wondering, like, you know, how... Where, where do you stand on the, the femboy Nesta Machno question? Um, I actually, I think that it is more likely than not. And I also love the phrase, um, uh, the, the femboy Nesta Machno question. It, it feels like a great punk band that could exist. Um, but yeah, no, he was, Machno was um, definitely the sort of person who liked to be there himself. So that matches. And uh, from everything I read, and I had some very generous help from uh, another anarchist historian out of Alberta, Sean Patterson, who found a photo of the Julia Polie um, uh, theater troupe that had a huge amount of anarchists in it, uh, including Machno, if I'm remembering right. And he was um, excited by theater as a kid and was in productions uh, which also included him uh, dressing up as uh, in um, the opposite gender's clothes. So like, I would say like, I would not bet against it. I think it seems likely uh, if it's something he's already familiar with. And listen, 
uh, Machno for all his virtues and vices definitely is like big into drama and also like knows all the Robin Hood stories or I guess the Pugachev stories of, you know, dashing subterfuge. So I, I would I would put it at greater than 80 to 90 percent that uh, historical femboy N Nestor Machno was a thing. Uh, I love this tangent, by the way. And then just all three of us were on mute, and it was great. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I realized yeah. that I should also ask, uh, uh, I should volley back a question. Um, so this is more of a, um, a zooming out question, but when I was writing No Harmless Power, there was a, uh, a section uh, in the book I had trouble writing. Uh, it's Machno. Machno gets back to Julie Polier after getting out of prison um, and starts a social revolution in Julie Polier. And he runs into trouble along with the other anarchists in finding a way to run revolutionary Julie Polier in a way that is anarchist. And uh, in his autobiography, he goes explicitly through um, uh, Bakunin, Malatesta, and um, uh, yeah, Kropotkin. He gets to meet Kropotkin. Um, I I'm very curious about, um, and this is like 1917, um, I'm curious about uh, your thoughts on the sort of uh, footprints of of those three in particular in uh, non-European spaces uh, with uh, revolutionary movements, like say 1917. So Kropotkin's the most widely translated historical anarchist. Um, he, he gets disseminated more, far more than anyone else. Um, Bakunin, much less so. Um, so he, the, the main text that gets republished is, is this text that's called God and the State, which is an extract from the book he didn't finish writing. Uh, and that gets translated low, so that's like one of the most wide, widely read things. Um, and and the, his, his, Bakunin's collected works first appears in French and then German and Spanish. But that, as far as I remember, is from like the 1920s onwards. Um, obviously, uh, it's also a thing of most of what he wrote was in French, uh, not Russian. I don't know how many languages Macno spoke, but it was common for people in the movement to speak French because that was the language that international, the international movement often used. Um, in the same way that now, you know, people of the place will speak English and talk to each other using that. Historically, it was French. Um, and his book, State of Manarchy, was the only book he ever wrote in Russian specifically. Um, but that, and that, like, that was reprinted, as far as I remember, like in, in, in Russia. Uh, and that was then the basis for the, the later translations of it. And it's not translated into a language other than Russian until, uh, off the top of my head, the first Spanish edition. Um, Malatesta, I'm never sure about how much he was disseminated. I know he was translated. Uh, obviously he wrote, you know, in Italian, but his articles do get uh, published in like the French press uh, and the Spanish press as well. So it was like translated. Um, but I'm always kind of curious of, you know, like in Macno's situation, what stuff did he have access to? You know, it's not like he could just go on LibGen and download or Anarchist Library and, you know, download all the PDFs. So I was kind of, I actually, yeah, I was reading that bit of the book today. I was kind of curious where, you know, I was wondering, like, what stuff did you find? Because, you know, there are, you know, depending on the text, you're going to get more specific or more broad answers to, like, how do we do anarchism in, like, an unbelievably agricultural context? Um, because, you know, in a lot of anarchist literature of the famous people, you know, the peasantry appears as a kind of, you know, here's how urban workers can go to the countryside in a way that will push the revolution forward and get the peasants on side rather than against the revolution. Um, or they'll be discussed in terms of, 
you know, that 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 we we basically often they'll talk about how we don't know how to spread ideas in the countryside and we need to figure this out. Um, and they don't necessarily have like solutions, but I think it's necessary to do that uh, because otherwise, you know, the revolution is purely urban, it will be like defeated. And one of the big things they care about is food production and the worry that food production will defeat the revolution, which is why I think it's so important in especially predominantly agricultural societies uh, to get the peasants on side. And, you know, in, in France at that time, way more of the economy was that was still agricultural than say compared to like uh, England during the Industrial Revolution, which had a much higher non-agricultural workforce than uh, other countries did. Um, and Spain, again, there was a big emphasis on organizing them. So I, th I feel like of all the anarchists to read, it would have, I think some of the Spanish stuff might have been more useful <laughs> for, for Magna, but you didn't have access to that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about, in terms of their dissemination within Russia. I know that Kropotkin was really involved from afar in the Russian anarchist movement. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he had this, he lived in exile because you know, he, he, he escaped from prison and so couldn't exactly go back to Russia. Um, uh, but he was in contact with people in Russia and I know the Russian anarchist movement, he was one of the main people that they published. But it's always, often when you're reading a book, it'll be like, you know, they published Kropotkin. I'm like, I want to know what they published by him. I want like, the specific lists of text, but they don't give that. So it makes it really hard to like track the dissemination of ideas. You know, I can find like an article in an anarchist paper, but I can be like, well, did they, what, how influential was this? You know, how much stress should I put on this? Because it might have just been read by, you know, a few thousand people, but in, in like one country, but wasn't widely uh, known about. Um, anyway, yeah, so I hope that's some kind of answer. Um. No, that was great. Um, the, the the source I got for, for that section was Machno's autobiography, and he did me... Uh, a really big solid by naming all three of those people we just talked about. Um, I can't find or prove which Malatesta uh, he had access to, um, but like between peasants of all of the Malatesta I've read, seems like the most like appropriate for Makhno because the Ukrainian peasantry really would follow anyone who promised them autonomy and control over their own land. Like it was a source of uh, peasant uprising for thousands, or no, thousands is wrong, hundreds of years. Like the last big one was the Pugachev uprising. Um, and so like, you know, pun intended, it would have probably found pretty fertile soil. And that was uh, part of anarchism's appeal uh, to non-city dwelling uh, Ukrainian anarchists. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, I haven't. Between peasants would make sense because it was one of the most widely reprinted texts that he wrote. Because um, he, he never wrote a book; it was it was overwhelmingly articles and then a few pamphlets. But the pamphlets tended to get reprinted. Um, mm. So Anna being the other one. Um, How, how are we doing for time in terms of like, when should we shift to Q&A? Yeah, um, we, could, we could go ahead and start bringing in some Q&A. Um, and I would encourage folks to, to write out any questions or things that you want more exploration of. Um, Jason uh, put in a question, which is intended to be a fun one. Um, so uh, presumably a, a kind of a non-serious answers are welcome here, it sounds like. but. Uh, Jason asks, what might Machnow and Malatesta do if they were in the present? Um, would or could their style of direct action and propaganda be implemented nowadays? Yeah, so can we time travel them to our present? What do they think about the state of uh, the state of anarchism, the state of the world? Um, I think they'd both be extremely depressed. Um, <laughs> because, you know, like Malatesta becomes an anarchist when he's a teenager, when it's for, you know, the revolution's going to happen in the next few years to the end of the 19th century, then the, it doesn't happen, but then the big revolutionary wave they're waiting for does happen, but then it gets crushed by fascism, and, you know, Malatesta like, dies under house arrest under fascism. Uh, so, like, both of them died before the Holocaust, you know, like, there'll be so much stuff where we just have to tell them about it, and they'll just be like, no. <laughs> Things didn't pan out. 
Um, in terms of like if their ideas are still relevant, I would say like yeah. So you know they both emphasize uh, trade union organizing, and that's still effective today, even though you know the radical unions were crushed and the bureaucratic unions were made even more bureaucratic and kind of you know th th it's harder to do the kind of revolutionary trade unionism that was possible in like the 1920s when you know unions are straight up having gun battles on quite a regular basis. Uh, or, you know, I, I read about CNT trade unionists who organized an insurrection which began with unionized sewage workers planting bombs under the, in the sewer under the police station. And that was the signal to start the insurrection. So it's like unionized sewage workers with explosives. <laughs> you know, so it's like, the, you know, there's certain things where it's like, OK, yeah, we can't exactly easily do that now, especially post 9-11 and in like a non-revolutionary situation. You know, we, we can still do strikes um, and rent strikes and also, you know, combative demonstrations. We can still spread ideas. I mean, you know, they didn't have the Internet. They were having to spread ideas through papers that were often easily censored or repressed by the government. Uh, so, you know, the Italian uh, government passes a law banning all anarchist newspapers at one point. But they'd already repressed so many anarchist newspapers that I think there was only like one newspaper left. So it was kind of like, you know, you didn't need to pass this law. You'd already destroyed uh, the means of spreading ideas. Well, now it's like way, you know, I, I can reach people extremely easily all over the world. Well, they, for example, would literally have to like smuggle anarchist literature into Russia in various clandestine ways. Like Kropotkin has a part of his biography where he, he goes to Europe, gets loads of radical literature, becomes an anarchist and he travels back to Russia and he has to like pay a smuggler to get it back in the country. So always like illegal literature, uh, get, you know, gets through. Well, now it's like, well, I can just post a thing and anyone with an internet connection can access it. And even if the internet's restricted in certain ways, you know, there's VPN, there's ways around it. So I think in many ways, we're in a greater position of strength to spread ideas. The problem is just that, well, the same is true for everyone else. You know, so fascists also can easily spread their ideas. Uh, you know, reactionary misogynists like Andrew Tate can, you know, make millions of teenage boys hate women uh, through the power of TikTok. Um, so, you know, it's both a strength, but also a danger because, you know, everyone else can also spread ideas and all their ideas aren't good. So that would be like my quick uh, answer. Any other thoughts on that one, Charlie? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I am afraid I have to second um, Zoe's thing about immediate depression if we somehow got uh, Machno into the present through a time time portal, um, uh, especially with the whole war in Ukraine thing. Um, I'm not sure what Machno would do. Um, he always wanted to be doing something. Uh, that, that is one of his virtues. Um, um, I think that his style of military focused, at least in the Russian Civil War, direct action isn't really practical right now. Uh, but I think that his um, agitation for the platform after, you know, clarifying a bit uh, is extremely relevant. Uh, a specific anarchist organization is uh, in my in completely unsolicited, okay, solicited uh, opinion is a, a very good idea and we should do it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure uh, how to answer this uh, in ways that Zoe hasn't or without turning this into accidentally a bit comedy sketch. So I'm not going to do that. And <laughs> We don't have to go deep into that. Maybe to poke at the thing you just said, though. Um, so I think people are probably aware, but maybe not, that um, there are uh, throughout the world um, anarchist federations and networks that subscribe to, you know, uh, you know, a, a contemporary, you know, evolution of the platform. Um, I, I guess I'd be, you mentioned in your in your opinion, you know, the idea that some of these strategies related to the platform are still good ideas and still valid. Are you, uh, I guess, if you have any reflections on kind of 
the evolution um, into the the 21st century of uh, the specific anarchist organizing and the platform? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a little, um, I have a tiny blurb to say about it, I guess. Um, it, it may not be the, the nicest thing I've ever said about Machno, but like platformism uh, gets a second life in South America. It's amazing how much of the European and Eurasian uh, social revolutions or attempted social revolutions make their way through refugees um, into South America. And that's where platformism gets its second life. And without Machno there to constantly, like Machno could not get out of his own way in a lot of ways. Like he kept picking fights with Voli. He was on really bad terms towards the end of his life with his wife. Um, and other people who would have liked to make his life easier and help him out. Well, and Arshinov ran back. Arshinov was a co-author of the platform. Uh, ran back to um, uh, the USSR and took a job as a, a member of the Soviet government, um, which is bad and not commendable behavior. He was also starving. It has been pointed out. So... Um, I'm not sure what I would do in that situation, but I like to think that I wouldn't become a Stalinist to not starve. Anyway, point of the platform in South America um, really grows to uh, large proportions, and there's still quite a bit of them in the trade unions. Uh, the Fora and FAO uh, are particularly good uh, examples. Um, in uh, North America, there was NEFAC, and there's the... Uh, Black Rose, uh, Rosa Negra Confederation, uh, that all do good work. Um, and uh, I'll let them speak for themselves. Uh, but yeah, the platform outside of Machno, I think is stronger than it was with Machno. And that's not a slam on him as a human, uh, as a theorist, but it is a little bit of, it's been a hundred years. It would be more shocking if platformism didn't change and adapt rather than staying exactly as it was in 1926. Zoe, I want to give you a chance to reply to that, but also we did have uh, Spencer chimed in through the Q&A to suggest that we all keep our eyes peeled for a 100-year anniversary edition of the platform published by PM Press uh, in 2026. Wow, we are really, we're, we're getting hyped. Um, <laughs> Uh, Spencer says that there will be an introduction by none other than Charlie Allison for that 100-year publication. Wow. That sounds cool. Okay, well, that sounds good. I hope the request, which is that can you make sure the new version also includes the follow-up articles, which are in Facing the Enemy, edited by Skerda in the appendix, because the follow-up articles like clarify so much that the original text is kind of a bit more ambiguous about. Uh, you know, the specifics of what happens when there's a split between a minority and a majority at a Congress and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm hyped for actually having a physical printed copy of the platform versus, like, uh, I know at the moment it's just an appendix of a book, is how I read it. Um, so, as for, so, so a specifism or anarchism in, 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 in uh, Latin America. It's kind of interesting because it's kind of a synthesis of loads of different views on, on organizational dualism. You know, so it's not just based on the platform. It's also, you know, they quote Bakunin's views on the topic. They draw upon Malatesta, who was, you know, not a platformist. Uh, he, he was a critic of the platform, um, although they did agree on a lot. But, you know, they had significant differences. Um, and and so and, and that's part of the ways in which I find it kind of interesting is that it's 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 drawing upon several different people rather than just like you know in isolation how can we make the platform better um there's a good text uh in terms of the, the best english language text for a specificism or anarchism is called top of my head uh social anarchism and organization by a, a group of a specificism anarchists in uh, brazil um i think it's Come on, I'm I think it's specifically Rio de Janeiro, but I don't want to get that wrong. Uh, but it's on the Anarchist Library if people want to read it. Um, 
and, and Black Rose Anarchist Federation, they've recently released like a new organizing, you know, document of like, this is what we believe it has like a nice front cover. Um, and so it's nice that, you know, platformism isn't kind of treating the platform like scripture, you know, the original in brackets says draft, it was a draft. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, it's nice that people, you know, are treating it like that and, and trying to refine these ideas and, and, and develop better ones in response to our situation, rather than kind of, you know, we're going to create a carbon copy of the original attempts at platformism when it first formed, which, you know, weren't super successful, right? It's like the first, there's two really organizations. There's a, the Russian Anarchist Federation in, in America who are, fund the paper that the platform group do. Um, and there's also the French Anarchist Federation. Uh, it, it renames itself several times in the course of several years. So it's like the Anarchist Federation, it's the Anarchist Communist Federation, that's the Anarchist Federation again. Then it's the, the you know, it keeps adding, the, the acronyms keep changing as their splits around the platform. Um, but it doesn't last long and um, it's kind of funny, you know, a core part of the platform is majority votes binding on everyone. Well, that means that that's one of the core changes that they make to the organization and the, the Anarchist Federation in France. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, the organization abandons platformism and, and renames itself, but despite Macno being at the meeting trying to be like, you know, persuade everyone. And part of how they're able to do that is because the, a majority of delegates vote against remaining platformists. And so the very, the new feature of the organization that majority votes are binding is what actually defeats the, the platform in this organization. Uh, and then they, the, the platformists then leave to form their own group with a slightly different acronym that basically is the same. And then they come back a few years later um, and remain a kind of like minority tendency within the organization. Um, but that's, yeah, French, French anarchist organization drama. Um, it's like the, the left hasn't changed much um, in terms of splits. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that would be my take. So pulling pulling more at that thread of like what has changed and how how might some of these tendencies evolve themselves. Um, we've got a question in the Q and A, um, which is it kind of starts off noting that the labor movement is very different now than it was a hundred years ago. Um, and kind of asking, um, you know, how historic anarchists um, might approach dualism, uh, organizational dualism in our present context, um, and uh, whether or not uh, a retained strong emphasis on the workers' movement uh, would be likely. Um, so when, you know, for context, when they're writing, uh, there are loads of, massive syndicalist trade unions which were explicitly revolutionary or have say you know like 600,000 members in a union you know uh, at their peak their members fluctuate a lot but um you know the, the point is they're massive revolutionary trade union movements that they can participate in um and obviously well now it's like you know the IWW is very small um in, in its modern like version there's loads of very small syndicalist organizations they end up kind of functioning as a specific anarchist organization that calls itself a trade union. You know, they're not, they're, they're, they're a group of revolutionaries who think syndicalism is a good thing and then try to do workplace organizing. Um, and so that they end up, as opposed to, you know, they are a mass union that has like the entire workplace in this industry, in this part of Spain, you know, all, all together. Although, you know, the CNT is still a thing, but obviously it's, I don't want to get into CNT drama because it's very complicated. There's loads of, loads of specific um, but in terms of the fact that it's changed, when in terms of like how actual syndicalist unions arose, in a lot of cases it was radicals participating in mainstream unions and persuading people uh, to, 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 to go in a more revolutionary direction, at the same time as, as workers themselves arrive at those ideas through their experiences of, of direct action. It was kind of both. And so it's this big kind of strike wave. Uh, that happens in like the early 1900s that coincides with like the, the, the rise of syndicalism as a mass movement. And so if you want to rebuild syndicalism today based on how it was actually built historically, it's not the way to do it isn't through we form a tiny group that's at most a few hundred people call ourselves a union. Uh, it's participating in the mainstream unions uh, where the workers already are, although there is one major difference, which is that well now 
at that time, way more workers were just in unions generally. They were way more class conscious as opposed to now where loads of workers aren't in the union and the unions that are, uh, you know, more bureaucratic. Uh, so, for example, you know, one of the unions that the, the French CGT emerges out of, the, the, the Revolution Syndicalist Union, it, it, it's originally in quite complicated ways tied to like an actual, you know, socialist party and then it splits from it. And that's obviously a very different situation of comes of, you know, we're going to participate in this mainstream union and radicalize it. Where it's like, it was already pretty radical. Where it's like, you know, that at Congresses, there will be, um, uh, you know, an explicit Marxist in the organization talking and that's normal to everyone, you know. Um, so I always struggle with, obviously things are different, but at the same time, the class in society that is capable of actually changing things, you know, remains workers. Uh, and a key part of the strength of workers is their ability to withdraw their labor because if they withdraw their labor they can ex impose pressure onto the ruling class to give into their demands because without it production you know can't go on so profit can't go on and so that that's a you know it's a question of imposing incentives onto the ruling class to give into our demands through the strength of collective power and, and the point of production is a key part of that it's not all of it but it is still a key part of it and, you know, if you look, the, the, in a lot of the kind of left, there's been an emphasis on kind of mobilizations and, you know, huge amounts of people in the street, you know, riots or, you know, mass protests. And that's all good. You know, I'm not against that. But in the absence of strong workers' power to impose that kind of collective pressure, it, it isn't that effective. So I, th I, I do think it's necessary and part of the weakness of the left at the moment is precisely the weakness of the working class more generally in terms of unions and how they've been defanged, but also, you know, smaller membership. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, when the first radical or even mainstream unions emerged, they were legal. It was illegal to have a union. You would be in prison for being in a union. And, and yet, despite much actually more extreme barriers to unionization in terms of state violence, they were able to organize these unions uh, which then resulted in them being legalized, um, like in France, for example. Uh, and so it's it's a thing of like, yes, there are huge barriers with the bureaucracy and with a you know, massive decline in working class consciousness. But at the same time, you know, it's not as if people in the past didn't have barriers, which in certain respects were actually greater. Um, and so I, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, a, it's so complicated, it's hard to say anything beyond like, I do still think unions play a role but it's complicated and we can't just, you know, repeat history. We have to act in our own situation. Um, so I hope that was some kind of answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, Charlie, do you have anything you want to add um, or along those lines? Uh, I think, I think uh, Zoe pretty much uh, covered it on that one. Cool, great. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. I want to get through at least this this last question here in the Q and A, um, which uh, someone submits along with greetings from Indonesia. Very cool. Glad you're here, Don. Um, so Don asks uh, about whether or not um, uh, y'all have any any comment on accusations that Macnow was anti-Jewish, um, and kind of what the backstory is on those accusations of anti-Semitism. Uh, and the, um, you know, kind of what the, the relevant program was in Ukraine at the time. Is that something either of y'all could share thoughts on? Uh, yeah, I, I could, I could uh, share thoughts on this. Uh, so Makhno and anti-Semitism, I, I feel quite comfortable saying that um, it's, it's a thing that is, made a talking point after the civil war and he's in exile and the Bolsheviks definitely use it as much as possible um, uh, to smear him and to smear the anarchists. Um, that said, it's not like the, everything was fine in Ukraine and no, no bad things ever happened there, especially with pogroms. Um, it's, it's very clear from reading Makhno and reading people who are around him that even before there was a civil war, 
uh, Makhno uh, was very much against pogroms. Uh, uh, once he gets, uh, you know, an army and an amount of territory, he has a pretty much summary execution for anyone caught of uh, caught up in uh, doing pogroms. Um, which is which is not typical, even a little, of um, uh, any army uh, in the Ukraine from 1917 to 1921. Um, yeah, he he. Uh, the the reason I believe that this is true is because even before there was a pragmatic reason not to do pogroms, um, before Makhno was anyone. Um, after Julia Poli is taken the t first time by the White Army, or what would become the, it's the Austro Hungarians. Sorry, I should, even I, who wrote a book on it, get confused about who owns what, when, or who's occupying where, when. Um, he, uh, he's hiding in the countryside around it, and some of his friends write an open letter to Machno, like, hey, what should we do? Uh, should we uh, resist? You know, we know X, Y, and Z collaborated. Also, maybe we should do a pogrom and write, Machno writes back, oh my God, no, what are you talking about? This is a terrible idea. Uh, don't, don't do any of what you just said. Uh, people who collaborated will get theirs, but a pogrom is so anti-revolution, I don't even know uh, what you're talking about. Don't do that. Um, and his behavior uh, bears it out. Um, he was very touchy about this personally. Um, he, he gave... Um, a very fiery retort at the Faubourg Club in Paris in, I think, the early, late 20s. Um, and, you know, they put him at the end of the evening. Um, the, the, the chief source he was responding to, responding to was a fictional, fictional account of the Machnavis by a guy named Kessler, but it's got that, that sort of Hollywood flair of but it's based on true events. Uh, so it's fiction, not fiction. And in that, they uh, Kessler accuses uh, Machno of rape and pogroms, which are two things he definitely didn't do, uh, but also charges him with murdering a pair of performing dwarves, which is a very odd thing to accuse someone of. Anyway, Machno tears into this, but his sort of... Um, Rebuttal is taking images that I, I believe this is still Kessler, uh, not Kubanin, um, another another Bolshevik who wrote about the Machnavists. Uh, there's an image of you know Bolshevik troops holding the now famous skull and crossbones, and you know death to um, all those who oppress the working class uh, thing. And Machno says, one, that's not our flag. Uh, that's a that's a separate anarchist thing, and two, that troop it wasn't even on the right side of Ukraine to do this at the time. Um, so I would say, broadly speaking, no, I would say completely, Makhno was not anti-Semitic, and he did not tolerate anti-Semitism. Um, you you see all this in his biography, and anyone who knew him uh, writes very firmly and unequivocally about this. Um, more than one person just made the mistake of assuming that because uh, you, Makhno was a popular Ukrainian uh, military leader that he must be anti-Semitic. There's a, a story in his biography, I think, or maybe it's Helena Kozmenko. I forget exactly where this is from, but there's a guy at a train station in Pologi Station in Ukraine who's got a sign up saying, you know, save Russia, beat the Jews. And Makhno's like, oh, hey, Whose sign is that? And the station master is like, oh, I put that up. And Makhno just shoots him. Uh, so really not, not very uh, okay with that. Um, he yells at Kubanin for getting the train station wrong in his account of the Makhno of Shina. Uh, like, well, you know, I did shoot that guy and he deserved it, but it was over here, not over there. Um, I, I could go on about this for a while because it's one of those weird... Uh, persistent things that authoritarian leftists like to smear Makhno with. Um, All right. 
dispensed. Um, we are closing in on our time together, and I'm wondering if y'all have um, maybe any any final thoughts on this time period and reasons why um, folks in the audience and maybe like anarchists and leftists more broadly should should read this history. What uh, you know, why why are you excited about uh, being able to have these conversations when when these things happened a hundred years ago? Um, how to put it? It's a thing of like, I know growing up, I was a lot of history that I learned was focused on you know history from the point of view of the ruling classes. So like at school, you know, we would learn about an English king called Henry VIII and his various wives. And, you know, that was kind of like the emphasis. And so I think it's just so important to see, you know, history from below and see history in terms of what social movements did and how they tried to change the world, often unsuccessfully, but often successfully. And that's why, you know, things aren't as terrible as they could be. It's because people just like us got organized, really believed in emancipation and tried to achieve it. Um, and I think that's really inspiring. Uh, you know, it can be easy to kind of just, it can kind of be doom pilled and think everything's terrible and that, uh, you know, socialism's failed and so forth. And it's like, it's more complicated. And there's so many things they did that did make the world a better place, even though, you know, capitalism, the state remain intact, um, you know, it, but have had a massive impact on people's lives, you know, in terms of like patriarchy being way less powerful than it was before, you know, changing attitudes about race, uh, you know, sexual orientations and so forth, like those changes have been extremely significant or even basic things like, you know, anarchists won the Ain Tower Day in Spain. Um, anarchists played a key role in winning the weekend in France. So if people in France and Spain are working less and enjoying weekends, well, that's because, you know, committed revolutionaries took action and, and that, you know, it, it still affects people today, even though, you know, the, the general strike that won the Ain Tower Day in Spain was, you know, around 100 years ago, so over 100, yeah, the, over 100 years ago with um, the winning of the of, of the um, weekend in France, and then subsequently, the, uh, sorry, the Ain Tower Day, and subsequently the weekend, which is uh, after um, they pass it in France after World War One to stop the Russian Revolution happening in France. <laughs> That's how they neutralize the revolutionary threat. It's go, okay, fine, we'll give you the entire day, which you've been wanting for ages. Um, anyway, so yeah, that would be my quick answer. Um, yeah, sorry, the, the reason for my gesticulation is um, I remember Kropotkin uh, towards the end of his life uh, was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of uh, over Russia. I'm going back to France. I think there's the best chance for a revolution to be there. Um, and so that that sort of tracks with what what Zoe was saying. Um, it, it was a moment of aha, but also I should answer the question. Um, I, I'm excited to read about uh, people who have been a hundred years dead, partly because, um, despite their different per individual personalities, they all uh, sort of rejected the idea, and this is um, uh, rejected idea the idea of someone else um delivering them into liberty right like it, it is all a uh go and do it yourself sort of energy definitely from um machno and kropotkin and goldman and we could go on uh, and that that gives me hope um and a desire to to do something about it um I, to, to pull a David Graeber quote that seems apropos here, the, the great secret of the world that is, is that it was made by us and it can be unmade by us. Things can be different. Um, and that is uh, very nice, empowering words. And hopefully they need lead to nice, empowering actions that uh, build on the successes that remain uh, like, you know, public libraries and what few unions we have left and the eight hour work day to play off of what Zoe had so artfully said, and we can keep pushing.
Fantastic. And I think that's a great note to end on. Um, it's been a real pleasure, uh, very um, satisfying and nerdy conversation. Would definitely encourage folks to pick up both of these books. Um, you can grab them from us or you can grab them from your local anarchist bookstore. Um, uh, you will find so much more in these resources, so many more stories and so much to be inspired by. Uh, Zoe and Charlie, thanks again. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you for having me. All right. And thanks to everybody who came and especially folks who submitted questions. Hope everybody has a great evening.